Good morning. My name is Haley Oliver, and thank you for joining us today. I'm the Interim Vice Provost for Graduate Students and Postdoctoral Fellows here at Purdue University and the Director of the Feed the Future Food Safety Innovation Lab. I'd like to draw your attention to some of the technical tips that we have for you as far as engaging with our webinar. First of all, if you need closed captioning, it's available at the bottom of the screen. As we um, conduct our webinar, we highly encourage you to place your questions in the Q&A function located at the bottom of the screen. And your, these slides are going to be available through the chat for if any reason you have a disruption to your webinar, they'll also be sent to you um, after the webinar itself. So if you have any trouble, again, viewing today's presentations, we invite you to use the links that'll be available in the chat and use them on your own computer. As we begin today's webinar, it's important to keep in mind the role that food safety can play in food security, namely that food security is only achieved when foods are safe, nutritious, accessible, and available. To help meet this need, the Feed the Future Food Safety Innovation Lab, or FISL as we call ourselves, was established in 2019 with funding from the Feed the Future, the, from Feed the Future, the US government's global hunger and food security initiative. FISL is jointly managed by Purdue and Cornell universities and we leverage global food safety expertise in locally led projects that address the root causes of foodborne illness. By identifying food safety knowledge gaps and developing data-driven food safety practices and policies, FISL projects aim to create systematic change that strengthens households and community, households and community nutrition, food security, and economic opportunity. For those of you who were with us for last week's webinar, we already heard how our research and engagement activities have focused on four main goals, increasing stakeholder awareness of food safety issues, impacts, and measures to reduce food safety risks, building local research capacity and conducting research on regional food safety challenges, supporting translation and dissemination networks to develop policies and, engage and engagement structures, and enhancing local capacity to translate food safety research into training, guidelines, and commercialized products. Our work has also incorporated the cross-cutting themes of empowerment of women and youth and other marginalized populations, human and institutional capacity development, and food safety enabling environments. Fizzle's research portfolio focuses on nutrient-dense, perishable foods, including dairy, poultry, fish, and vegetables. Our target countries have included Bangladesh, Cambodia, Kenya, Nepal, Nigeria, and Senegal. In developing our research portfolio, we knew that women are key partners in food system change with untapped potential to influence food safety and nutrition. Women play important roles in preventing foodborne disease throughout the food system from agriculture production and food processing to vending and home meal preparation. Because of this, we have sought to engage and empower women in our research projects to increase access to safe, nutritious diets. Our approach has included requiring the recruitment of a gender specialist to every long-term subaward, incorporating gender throughout the life cycle of the project, assessing gender roles, decision-making, access to resources, and power dynamics in target value chains, and tailoring trainings and outreach to meet women's needs. In last week's webinar, we explored how social behavior change is key to effective food safety practices. Today, we'll hear from researchers working to understand gender dynamics and value chains in households and using this knowledge to inform more effective food safety practices, policies, and outreach. Today, it's an honor to welcome researchers from our three projects to share their results through the lens of women's empowerment. Information about the broader project objectives and activities will be shared through links in the chat. We have focused on implementing research that includes women as key stakeholders in shaping program priorities and activities, and they have vital practical insights on engaging and empowering women in a range of countries and value chains. For today's webinar, we will share three presentations that have been pre-recorded by our speakers, followed by a live panel discussion. Throughout the presentation, feel free to enter your questions for the panel discussion using the Q&A function. It's now my pleasure to introduce Leah Thompson. Leah will graduate with her PhD in August 2024 from Purdue University, where she, reaches where she researches interdisciplinary approaches to international development in agriculture. With an academic background in animal agriculture, Ms. Thompson has pivoted her doctoral research to study gender in international agriculture development contexts, particularly in food safety. Her other research interests include qualitative research and development, 
sustainable agriculture, and feminist theory. In addition to her contribution to the FISL project in Cambodia, her recent work includes studying food safety and nutrition in Lao PDR and employ, employ, employability, excuse me, in agriculture diversity graduates in Egypt. Over to you, Leah. Hello, everyone. My name is Leah Thompson, and I am a PhD candidate at Purdue University, and I'm a part of the Feed the Future Innovation Lab for Food Safety Cambodia team. Today, I'll be sharing some of my key findings from my project, Informing Food Safety Engagement, a Gender Analysis of Cambodia Vegetable Production. Okay, so I'm part of this larger project for the Cambodia project, and the overarching objective is all about reducing foodborne pathogen contamination of vegetables in Cambodia. And now there are three main parts to this. The first part involves identifying the problem. This includes identifying and mapping the critical control points for foodborne illnesses in Cambodia's informal vegetable value chain. So that involves looking at the ideological agents and where in the value chain um, these agents are causing problems. After establishing uh, what the problem is and where the problem is occurring, we want to uh, next do some targeted research. This includes evaluating new and existing interventions to reduce microbial contamination and this includes measuring attitudes and perceptions and knowledgeability amongst Cambodians about food safety. And this is really what we're going to be talking about today. The third component is engagement. And this relates to developing data-informed Cambodian-led food safety programming for sustainable adoption of food safety practices. So, we know that women are foundational to Cambodia's informal vegetable value chain. In fact, 44% of employed Cambodian women work in agriculture, and that is compared to 39% of employed Cambodian men. Furthermore, women are involved in every step of Cambodia's vegetable value chain. So uh, this includes producing vegetables, selling them, transporting and purchasing vegetables, uh, as well as cooking and storing them. However, we will be unsuccessful in reducing foodborne pathogen contamination in our vegetables unless we can make sure that we meaningfully engage Cambodian women in all facets of the project. But at the same time, we don't want to further burden them in ways where women don't directly benefit. So with this in mind, we have a few guiding questions for this gender analysis. The first is we want to know how are Cambodian women vegetable producers, uh, labor responsibilities and time distributed? The second question is what influences the distribution of Cambodian women vegetable producers, labor responsibilities and how they spend their time? So really, we're not actually getting into any food safety content um, with this gender analysis. At this stage, we just want to know if we were to implement a food safety project, which production stages are women most involved in, what else demands their time, and what factors can promote or inhibit successful food safety engagement without further burdening women. So our gender analysis is guided by standpoint feminism, um, a, term, a term coined by Sandra Harding in the 1980s. And according to standpoint feminism, different social standpoints shape independent identities and as such knowledge production. However, marginalized standpoints can offer unique perspectives and knowledge. So as such, we should be considering these multiple identity defining components of someone's standpoint. So therefore, if we want to improve food safety of vegetables consumed in Cambodia, we should probably be informed by Cambodian women vegetable producers and value chain actors. Second, 
we should consider Cambodian women vegetable producers' perspectives beyond their gender identities. So what are other identity components that shape their standpoints um, as women and as vegetable producers? So we used women's responses from 20 semi-structured interviews to create individual vignettes of each woman. These provided insights about other aspects of women's identities that could not necessarily be easily communicated through uh, numbers or a chart, for example, um, but shaped their identities and experiences as vegetable producers. So this included 12 interviews from Battambang province and eight interviews in women from Siem Reap province. As you can see right here in this figure, this illustrates some of the significant gendered labor trends. So if we're starting at the top left corner with the seed and ending in the bottom right with the harvested vegetable that's ready for selling, we can see that some of these tasks are certainly more gendered than others. And if you look at these size differences, the bigger the size discrepancy, the more gendered that task is. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more. So to answer our first question about how women vegetable producers labor and time are distributed, we found that women spend tend to spend more time on activities such as hiring labor, managing money both on the farm and at home, harvesting activities, um, cooking, food preparation, as well as child care. We then found that women spend less time on land preparation. So this includes activities like plowing, leveling soil, building soil beds, um, things like those and then uh, equipment maintenance as well. Now, these aren't, uh, these aren't always the case, but this, these are just the patterns that we found. So as I mentioned in a previous slide, our standpoint feminist theoretical framework inspired us to look for other factors that shaped Cambodian women vegetable producers' multifaceted identities. And then if we look at this figure, we can see that by looking at the effects and by recognizing the effects of other standpoint components, we have this more comprehensive idea about women's time and labor. And most notably, we observe trends with both age and provincial differences. So for example, uh, responsibilities for other value chain roles, um, if you can see that's in the kind of bottom right corner, um, other value chain roles mean things, activities like vending and selling vegetables or collecting vegetables and acting as a middleman. So these tasks were more equally distributed amongst men and women in our Battambang interviews, but in Siem Reap, this was usually responsibilities that were completed by women. So to answer our second question about what influences women's labor and time, we found that type and the level of familial support have uh, play a big factor. So specifically, one, one prominent example is that husbands without additional off-farm jobs can provide support because they can divide up daily labor responsibilities However, they perpetuate more gendered labor distributions. So this means that in the opposite scenario, we found that husbands that had off-farm jobs and sources of income, um, they provide financial support, but then women have a wider range of responsibilities around the farm and around the home. Additionally, living in intergenerational households can offer support because there's more people to disperse different labor responsibilities. We found this to be the case with tasks that were not too physically in intensive or exerting. So things like, like weeding. Older family members could, when they had time, help out with weeding, which is a task that needs to be done throughout the production process. Um, and 
can make a dent in, in time. We also found that having more people to divvy up social responsibilities like attending ceremonies and, and other social events gave women more time. So from this, we gathered that familial support can in some instances impact women's access to professional or social spaces. Secondly, we found that individual and local definitions and perceptions can impact labor and time distributions. So for, for example, Cambodian women vegetable producers, different perceptions of opportunity will shape how we engage women in our future food safety projects. So a few of our interview questions asked the women about their perceptions regarding opportunities and access to things like training programs and what their experiences were with that. We found that um, women did not believe that they had opportunities to join agricultural training programs like a farming workshop, for example, unless they individually received an invite. This turned out to be the case several times, but one notable example was one woman who lived with her uh, mother-in-law who was also a vegetable producer. And this woman said that she never had opportunities to participate in ag agriculture training programs. However, we also found that they did receive invites to go to these types of events, but these invites always went to her mother-in-law and her mother-in-law didn't necessarily have interest in attending these. So, and this happened multiple times. What this tells us now is if we were to post a call out flyer in a public spot about a food safety workshop, um, we won't be very successful in encouraging women's participation. So there's a couple takeaways as we move forward. Um, the first is that future food safety projects should consider the gender distribution of farm tasks when identifying the best audiences for training programs. So for instance, projects that are focused more on safe harvesting practices are more likely to engage women than if we were to focus on a, a project that spends most of its time on land preparation. In addition, women with less familial support will likely experience additional barriers to being able to engage in food safety engagement projects. And there are ways that we can minimize these potential barriers. Um, one easy example is because women are time impoverished, we can conduct the same workshop with the same exact content, just offer multiple times at the same location for women to attend. That way, this can appeal to different schedules. Furthermore, uh, standpoint feminist theory was really helpful because it put us in the right mindset to where considering the multiple components of Cambodian women vegetable producers identities resulted in a more comprehensive and holistic understanding of how their labor and time are distributed and influenced. And because labor trends and perceptions vary by both community and individual, this is a testament to the reason why such preliminary analyses will increase the likelihood of successful and sustainable food safety outcomes by adjusting to people's individual needs. Thank you so much for listening and I look forward to our discussion. Thank you, Leah. We really appreciate your insights. It's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Falake Samuel. She was a professor of community nutrition at the University of Ibadan and serves as co-principal investigator for Fizzle's project in Nigeria. With a background in food science and technology, as well as human nutrition, Dr. Samuel's interests include the areas of child feeding, micronutrient nutrient nutrition, food systems, innovations, and more recently, leadership and nutrition. She has over 25 years of technical and programmatic experience with a proven track record of successful local and international multidisciplinary collaborations and research. Over to you, Flake. 
Good day, everybody. I would like to start by appreciating the Feed the Future Innovation Lab for Food Safety for inviting me to be a panelist in this webinar, which is a platform to share our collective knowledge for better impact on food safety in our countries and globally. I will be sharing on our research in Nigeria titled Using the Our Voice Mobile App to strengthen household food safety in Nigeria. This is part of a larger study titled Household Level Food Safety Risk and Community Capacity to Monitor and Mitigate Food Illness in Nigeria. And the collaborative study is made up of a team of researchers from three institutions in Nigeria and two institutions in the United States. In this component, the Our Voice component, our aim is to document the lived experiences of mothers in the provision of safe and nutritious foods for their families through a citizen science approach. We expect that this will inform future efforts to improve food safety in the country and to mitigate foodborne illness among families who have young children. We did qualitative data collection, essentially, which yielded documentation in form of photographs and narratives from mothers using the Our Voice Discovery Tool mobile application. Um, to provide more details of the methodology, we recruited 55 community dwelling citizen scientists. Um, I would say that citizen science, science is a qualitative and participatory action research strategy involving members of the community the non-scientists are collaborating with scientists in collecting and analyzing data for research purposes. So in this study, we recruited mothers from the five local government areas in the city of Ibadan in southwestern Nigeria. And this spanned across both low and high wealth index categories of mothers. Um, in this study, we uh, went through a multiple step process designed to understand the factors and conditions that make households vulnerable to food safety risks. And the first and the second steps involved the awareness creation and training of mothers on the use of the app. This was done um, before the data collection, which was the discovery phase and the discussion phase. In the discovery phase, the mothers captured photographic and narrative data about the barriers and facilitators uh, of uh, food safety. And the data was collected around several themes of food safety, several domains rather, including proper food storage, food handling, preparation, cooking and eating, hand washing, and so on. We provided daily prompts in form of simplified questions um, that were translated from English to the local language Yoruba. And this was given daily through the apps. So for example, one of the daily prompts was what makes it easy or what makes it hard for you to wash your hands properly when preparing and eating food. Mothers then responded to this prompt by taking relevant pictures and using text notes or voice notes even to answer the question according to their own lived experiences. Um, we did qualitative data analysis of all this data, and we also brought the mothers together in the discussion phase to cap it all up. We are the mothers shared the photographs, their photographs with their fellow citizen scientists. They shared um, perspectives, they suggested common themes, and they prioritized target areas and brainstormed solutions for these uh, problems that were identified. What did we find out? 12 themes emerged from the discussions and from the um, discovery phase. Five of these themes were identified as facilitators of food safety in the household, while seven were identified as barriers. And these themes cut across both low and high wealth index categories of the mothers. Um, remember that the objective of this uh, voice component was to document the lived experiences of the mothers in the provision of safe 
um, and nutritious foods for their families. So the first of the five facilitators of food safety practices has to do with access to resources, equipment, and basic amenities, as exemplified by the lived experiences of the mothers. So um, access to things like electricity, reliable electricity, functioning freezers, and so on, allows for the safe storage of food, both raw and cooked, as we can see here um, in the quotes. Another facilitator has to do with um, having physical access to safe and hygienic food retail vendors for the purchase of cooked or raw foods. This inspires consumer confidence and ability to practice food safety. The safe food vendors follow best practices for storing, preparing, and displaying foods, and this minimizes the risk of contamination of food, whether raw or cooked. A third facilitator has to do with personal values, practices, and strategies, such as cleaning the cooking environment and washing hands thereafter before the household food preparation. This plays a cru crucial role in maintaining good food safety in the household, as mentioned by this citizen scientist from Ibadan North local government. This person is in the high wealth index group. The fourth facilitator for food safety practices um, relates to proximity and ease of movement in the household. This facilitator highlights the benefits of physical layouts, especially proximity, and how it allows for the ease of movement between the eating and the washing areas in the family. This promotes good hygienic practices. And I, I want to say that at this point, may seem obvious, but in our context, many housing settings, especially among the low income, do have the kitchen as a separate structure from the main dwelling. So this aspect of proximity is um, a crucial one. Another facilitator is, the, is similar to the one that has just been discussed and this one talks about non-communal living. So having a private kitchen is one of the key factors that differentiates non-communal living from communal living arrangements. This mother says she can maintain her own hygiene standards without needing to coordinate with a co-user of the kitchen. Let us look at the barriers. What barriers, what are those things that make it difficult to maintain good food safety practices? Uh, like I said before, seven themes emerged, and many of the um, themes are actually opposite in nature to the facilitators that we have already mentioned. For instance, lack of access to resources, equipment, and basic amenities, um, when electric, electricity supply is not constant, when the simple furniture like the dining table is lacking and uh, when the household does not have a proper kitchen and so cooking is done in the passage or corridor of the house as we can see in this third photograph it says we do not have a kitchen facility we make use of the passage for cooking this makes maintaining hygiene quite difficult but we are managing another barrier is the presence of rodents, pests, and insects, which was common to almost all of the households. This heightens contamination risk. Number three barrier is the issue of communal living and sharing of space, as earlier mentioned. It is indeed a challenging lived experience that constitutes a barrier to food safety in the households of the citizen scientists in some of the in this um, study. The fourth barrier is an interesting one uh, that stems from the common practice of eating out. Data from the Nigeria Food Systems Dashboard indicated that the percentage of households who eat at least one main meal um, away from the home in one week is 62% in Oyo State. Uh, Oyo State is the state that houses Ibadan, where this uh, our particular study was carried out. So if 62% of the people are eating out of the home, it means it's a common practice. 
So the citizen scientists identified lack of control over food safety in eating out occasions as a barrier, um, as illustrated by this mother, who expressed uncertainty about the source of food sold, as well as, as lack of control over hygiene, especially for hawkers, those sellers of food who are roving from place to place and being exposed to different types of contamination. This mother also mentioned deceptive appearance, where food may look visually appealing and neat, but does not guarantee safety. Let's look at another barrier to food safety as um, uncovered by the mothers. On safe food retailing by market food vendor. This quote captures it all. This is a food shop in a market. If you notice, you will see that all the food stuff for sale on the table are all opened up without anything to prevent fry, flies from landing on it. And some people who come to buy dip their hands in to taste, some with dirty hands carrying all sorts of bacteria and germs. The sixth barrier is um, a personal constraint. Personal constraints of various forms were mentioned by the mothers. And a good example is this that is shown in this picture, having to climb down the stairs every time to get water. So this uh, potentially creates a barrier to food safety because the back and forth movement between the water source and the food preparation area can incre increase the chance of introducing contaminants to food or utensils. Um, at the same time, it can also be inconvenient to do that. And so this will serve as a disincentive to clean hands regularly. The last barrier has to do with environmental conditions. The macro environment of the household um, constrains women and this mother took this photograph of a public refuse dump, which is not far from her own kitchen area. So although she's knowledgeable about the food safety and health implication of this, she appears helpless because this is a macro environmental issue, a wider metropolitan management issue, as we can see in the picture. Having identified the facilitators and the barriers, Mothers came up with priority interventions, which they felt would help to improve the situation in their households as follows. Provision of essential community amenities and routine inspection of their buildings, public sensitization on safe food and hygienic practices, food safety education for food, both for both uh, vendors of the raw and cooked foods, enforcement of regular environmental sanitation practices, and also multi faceted stakeholder um, involvement in promoting safe food practices. These were all identified as priority interventions by the mother. Now, as we go to the end of this presentation, let's look at some lessons that we learned from um, deploying the Our Voice tool in Nigeria. Um, we agree that it is a valuable approach for understanding household level food safety in Nigeria through the eyes and voices of those who are actually living in it, those who are experiencing it. And so they were able to document the household reality of daily living to capture the food safety risk. It also helped researchers to better understand and navigate the world of these participants. It also enabled co-creation of transparent research and contributions to scientific discoveries as it relates to food safety. However, as rewarding as this could be, it came with some challenges. It came with the challenges of phone incompatibility, whereby some of the mother's phones were not compatible with the app. We also experienced poor network um, for the uploading, which hindered the uploading of pictures and text during the research. Sometimes we also encountered misinterpretation of the daily research prompts, but the research assistants were available to backstop this in the community uh, immediately. In some cases, we find that, that the narration that was accompanying the photographs of the mothers 
did not quite align. And so that was also um, a limitation. Then there were some photographs that did not even have narration. So we didn't really know what the mothers wanted to portray uh, through these photographs. However, overall, overall, we agree or we observe that engaging in the women, engaging the women in documenting their lived experiences empowered them both directly and indirectly. First, it helps them, the, the daily prompts opened their eyes to actually identify the food safety related risks in their families. And then the project provided real time relevant, context relevant data which sometimes may be overlooked by external researchers because they are not living within that context. The study also promoted women to woman learning uh, at the discussion phase, at the post data collection uh, phase. The citizen scientists shared practical and relatable personal value strategies and practices as relating to food storage, uh, preservation, and hygiene. And this promoted women to woman learning. Uh, finally, the ability to make use of their mobile phones in an innovative way, capturing photographic and narrative data with a new phone app actually made the woman to, women to feel empowered as active participants in scientific research. So overall, we'll say the Our Voice app is fun and promotes sharing. Thank you very much for uh, your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Falake. Really, really fascinating insights. And we look forward to, your, to, to, to you responding to questions here momentarily. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Samina Lutha, who is an Associate Professor of Sociology at the University of Dhaka and a Senior Research Fellow at the Center for Entrepreneurship Development at Brock University. She serves as the Gender Advisor and Co-Principal Investigator for Fizzle's multidisciplinary research project on food safety and fish and chicken value chains in Bangladesh. Dr. Lupta is an, act, activist, an activist researcher and a playwright actor who works on environmental justice movements, political ecology, feminism, and media. She holds master's degrees from the University of Dhaka and Lehigh University and earned her doctorate from the University of Oxford. She is currently working on topics including slow fashion, tiger windows and their climate change adaptations and fish production value change, labor rights in the apparel industry and environmental and political protest in South Asia. Over to you. So greetings from Bangladesh. This is Dr. Samina Lutfa. I am uh, going to talk about our experience regarding the uh, gender related food safety situation in Bangladesh in the fish value chains. Uh, so today I present um, uh, my findings um, uh, and uh, I have titled the presentation as Women's Voices on Food Safety in Bangladesh's Fish Value Chains. Although the project looks at both fish and chicken value chains, this presentation will deal only with the fish value chain related data. Uh, so here is an outline. Um, I will briefly talk about the project objectives and also the theories and assumptions from the literature. Then I will uh, talk briefly as well about the data and methods and then present my results, which is going to be both qualitative and quantitative. Uh, so the project has three major objectives, uh, among which the first one includes uh, an exploration uh, to trace out gender related uh, knowledge, attitude and practice uh, scenario among female value chain actors. Uh, also, I want to explore women's unpaid working hours in processing, producing and retail work in aquaculture. Uh, we will also look at uh, uh, food safety and hygiene related gender norms. Under the second objectives, um, uh, I will uh, look at uh, a differential analysis of willingness to pay, which is mostly consumer focused. Uh, and uh, the question is, are women more likely to spend more money for safe uh, products? To reveal the reasons behind women consumers' willingness to pay uh, is also something that we will um, explore in this presentation. Uh, and the third objective uh, is, although it's about training, uh, this is not covered in, this, in today's presentation so I will just skip over. 
from the literature, we found uh, different ideas about the gender norms uh, and aquaculture. In general, in agriculture, we have found that uh, sources suggest most female unpaid farm laborers come from households uh, led by men. Uh, and a more focused analysis looks at women, uh, women spending uh, a significant portion of their daily lives uh, meeting family and reproductive roles, which are gendered, and uh, besides their paid work, uh, thus creating a double burden of work on these women. So if we look specifically into the aquaculture and fisheries sector, we find that women's contribution is low, undervalued, and underrecognized. Uh, from a more focused uh, study of the literature on food safety and gender in aquaculture, we found that female producers uh, in aquaculture face different challenges due to varied gendered norms and access to assets. Uh, as well, we found that some scholars suggested women do not make decisions about one management strategies product usage and sales uh, and also um, some other sources found that both males and females reported similar levels of food safety knowledge however females practiced safe food preparations more frequently uh, and uh, uh, from above all we also found from several sources that more women are concerned about food safety and are engaged in safe food behaviors than men. Uh, so from all these findings, we um, uh, kind of um, we guess that it's going to be different uh, uh, knowledge, attitude and practice for women and men. Uh, women consumers will um, have a differential understanding uh, and willingness to pay for safer food, and they would have different reasons for this. Uh, so to delve deeper, we I will um, go into the sort of empirical data section uh, of this presentation. So I present data from four different sources in this presentation. The first two sources are surveys. Uh, the first survey is female producers only survey, uh, and it was done in Mymensin district. Uh, the second survey is a more broader survey using uh, surveying uh, producers, traders, and consumers consumers, both males and females, and um, the sample size is much bigger. Uh, I also collect data, collect some qualitative data using focus group discussions of female consumers only. Uh, for fish uh, consumers, we have done eight uh, focus group discussions in seven districts uh, in Bangladesh, uh, consisting of about 77 participants. Uh, and uh, we also uh, studied uh, more in depth uh, of experimental auction consumers on consumers and in three different districts in Mayanshi, Kutrakali, and Narangarj. Uh, for, bo for both survey uh, number two and experimental auction, we have uh, data for males and females, but now I will, uh, I will be presenting or focusing more on the gender segregated data and try to tell a story of what is happening in case of producers, traders and consumers about knowledge, attitude, practice, about uh, decision making, about unpaid working hour, and also if they find safer fish, what are the willingness of these uh, women consumers to pay. And even if they want to pay higher, then why do they do that? So this is the story that I'm trying to unravel in the next uh, few slides. Uh, it was a excellent learning opportunity for me uh, to be able to know all these different women from mostly from working class background, uh, but also uh, some of these women were not really uh, coming from as modest background as, as most of them. Uh, the first survey uh, looks at the knowledge attitude practice of uh, female fish producers. 90% of the respondents practice basic hygiene in fish farming. Uh, however, uh, very um, we need to be very careful in looking at that uh, at that point because 30 to 40 percent of the female value chain actors were unaware of the safe practices regarding fish pollution preservatives and feed additives which is um, uh, very concerning uh, and even more so is um, is the fact that 50 percent were unaware of the adverse effect of growth promoting feed. Uh, so we already have identified uh, the areas where uh, these women producers need training on. Uh, 
to uh, emphasize more on that, uh, we actually checked uh, their knowledge, attitude, and practice scores and categorized them in three different categories of poor, moderate, and adequate scores. Uh, chi square between knowledge, attitude, practice categories were significant for female fish producers. Uh, but you can see that um, in case of knowledge, uh, the scores are um, uh, kind, uh, we can see that the uh, uh, scores are adequate, scores are about 50, more than above 56 percent. So there are uh, more than 40 percent of um, our sample uh, actually falls between the categories of poor and moderate. Uh, in case of attitude, the scores are very high. So most women uh, are in the adequate category, uh, while for practices is similar, uh, although um, it's lower than the attitude scores. Uh, so for the next slide, we will uh, talk about women's unpaid working hours. And we have seen that 80% uh, of the female value chain actors spend two to three hours a day in fish farming. And uh, on an average, this is 2.42 hours per day, which is unpaid aquaculture work. Uh, and uh, more concerning is that 85% of these uh, females never received any training. Uh, so, you know, uh, when uh, we were looking at the knowledge um, scores, as well as the fact that they'd never received training, kind of um, uh, uh, adds up to the fact that these women producer needs more training to be able to produce safer fish uh, for Bangladeshi consumers. This survey also uh, looks at uh, how these producers are be making decisions so that we can understand their empowerment by being, uh, you know, part of this uh, value chain. Uh, but uh, the scenario is not very optimistic because a staggering 23% perceive that their families never value their contribution. Uh, and then we see that although after they have started to participate in the fish farm, uh, which is um, kind of a newer phenomenon for this sample, uh, about 99% thought that their position has been changed because of this participation. Uh, however, their decision making uh, regarding household expenditures is still lagging behind because about 47% of the respondents never made the decisions and only 25% always took the decision in case of their own expenditure. Uh, However, most importantly, fish farm related decisions like selling or buying land were never or rarely made by women, which is another big um, area of uh, intervention for, uh, for any gender transformative strategies. In the sur uh, second survey uh, where we collected data from both male and female producers, traders and consumers, we see that the data is a, slight, it's, it's a bit different than what we found in case of only female producers uh, survey. Here, uh, all three types of um, value chain actors have very poor uh, knowledge index. And uh, this, uh, when we look at their attitude scores and practice scores, we have also seen that uh, in case of attitude, similar to the survey one, uh, their attitude scores were in the higher side while their practice score were in poor and moderate categories, uh, which has some similarities with the uh, sample survey number one. We looked at um, what determines uh, these um, uh, knowledge attitude practice scores and among the consumers we have seen that practice scores are determined by gender, education, occupation, income and training, uh, which is kind of uh, what we have been trying to say so, so far that uh, women actually lack training and their education is a very important uh, determinant. Also for consumers, gender is also a very important determinant. So in order to focus a little bit more on this uh, side, we looked at uh, consumers uh, KV and we looked at whether it's gendered or not. Uh, so our uh, sample t-test, uh, uh, independent sample t-test, uh, uh, compared the mean practice scores and uh, uh, the difference is significant between females and males. So females have a slightly higher uh, practice score uh, than males in this uh, sample. And uh, although statistically not significant knowledge and attitude scores of female were high, uh, or were slightly lower, sorry, slightly lower than males. Um, and uh, the chi-square test also was statistically significant indicating a small to medium relationship between practice and gender categories. So uh, practice, safer uh, fish uh, practices are actually related to gender. So this is something that we found from the second uh, survey. Uh, 
The third uh, source of our information is the qualitative focus group discussions uh, on female consumers. And these discussions um, reveal that consumers' knowledge and practices about handling fish safely differed according to their household income and level of education, which actually is uh, quite um, in line with what we found in uh, survey two. And uh, we also saw that consumers, gender and education was important. So, so was household income. Uh, lower income consumers cook and eat fish without preserving it longer, which kind of can save them from um, not having a lot of um, knowledge about the safe um, free, uh, you know, preservation techniques. However, uh, this is not uh, good in the long run. If they start preserving, and don't, do not have uh, knowledge about safer uh, preservation, then that's, uh, uh, that will be an issue uh, for food safety. Uh, preservation practices after cooking are mostly unsafe, including freezing, because uh, some of them do not own fris fridge and uh, use, uh, they use a neighbor's uh, fridge. And in that fridge, their uh, frozen items often gets mixed up and they can end up eating uh, unsafe food, uh, which was not really um, preserved by themselves. Consumers also have difficulty identifying safer fish and managing to meet their nutritional needs. So food security is a major issue here still. Uh, for information or provision of safe fish, they do not trust the local retailers and wanted intervention by the government. Uh, female consumer FGDs also um, looked at whether they are aware of safer fish and we also found that there are different understanding of safer fish. Some uh, things that if the bhab is okay or the, the look of it, the status of it, then it should be safe. Uh, they all have almost no understanding about, um, about heavy metal uh, or antibiotic residues in the in their in the fish that they're eating however since uh, our uh, microbiological data show that it's not very rampant in even in the market uh, generated market collected um, fish samples uh, this might not be that much of a uh, hazard or concern uh, however we can see that it's really difficult for them uh, they cannot afford to throw away food even if it's not that good because uh, it has to be stinking unless they wouldn't um, uh, until they would throw it away uh, and even if they throw it away they will probably make it uh, you know uh, make their cats to eat it uh, this is uh, another example which is not very uh, universal. So some women who had more education would know how to keep raw and cooked fish uh, separately. Uh, however, not all of the women um, uh, with the FGDs knew this. A female consumer's gender norms uh, uh, are discussed here from the FGDs. And uh, although earlier it was mostly men's job to do the shopping, uh, we have seen there is a transformation and women are uh, in charge of doing the shopping as well, because they think female claims that males often buy bad fish and do not give enough time. Uh, and about preference of who is buying fish uh, uh, for whom, uh, this is a quote that I it is worth mentioning. Uh, I start from, uh, Quote, I choose the fish that my children prefer, followed by my husband's choice, and finally a combination of my family's preferences. I like the fish that will increase blood circulation in our bodies. So there are two things that uh, we uh, see from this quote. One is that the preference of women in the household is actually non-existent non when they're uh, choosing which fish to buy. And also they know somewhat, uh, they have somewhat understanding of the relationship between safer food and their nutrition and bodily needs. Uh, they rarely purchase expensive fish, often buys one or two types, specifically um, more likely to be buying tilapia and rui, rohu. Uh, shopping, cleaning, cooking, and preservation of cooked food is female household members' task, which is very gendered. Women almost never make decisions about land buying, household expenditure, etc., and so on and so forth. Uh, about willingness to pay who, why, and uh, or whether they're willing to pay more and why they are willing to pay more if they are, uh, we ask these consumers and most consumers, despite lacking food security, propose that although they cannot afford to buy uh, expensive fish, uh, if they are, even if they are safe, uh, they suggested that they can, uh, they are willing to buy less amount of fish at a higher price than to eat unsafe fish, uh, which is uh, a 
good thing to know and we know where to sort of intervene in in order to make that possible that uh, all of them despite their earnings can actually have safer fish uh, consumers were willing to pay more for to buy safer fish for the sake of ensuring the health of their family members especially their children and these are some quotes that they are which are kind of contradictory to each other they sometimes say that they do not go for big fish that's where uh, bad things happen they buy small fish they eat um, and cook and eat quickly so they do not preserve for long times uh, however uh, they also said that um, they do they, it's really difficult for them to afford uh, to buy safer fish if the price premium was too high uh, because, uh, but, but they also mentioned that no one uh, i i start with the quote no one want to buy unsafe fish but often we do not know how to get them with the money we have been given in quote so the money that comes to them for shopping comes from someone else if they are not if they're housewives then they they get the money from their husbands and uh, uh, that's a constraint that will um, you know determine how much what kind of fish they're going to buy uh, given the fact that they they're going to uh, give preference to their children's choices now uh, I'm almost at the end of this presentation. I will present uh, some data uh, from the experimental auctions uh, to understand the willingness to pay in further detail, more quantitative terms. Uh, experimental auctions uh, were conducted with all three types of uh, fish that we uh, uh, worked on in this project, tilapia, pangasias, and rohu, uh, in three locations, Maimonsi, Kutuakali, and Narayanganj. The control fish were procured from uh, traditional markets, while the trial fish is were prepared following uh, from our ponds where we followed uh, good aquacultural practices uh, in uh, in Maiman Singh. So this is a sort of chart that tells us that on um, uh, seeing appearances alone, uh, consumers are still willing to pay uh, more for the trial uh, fish uh, types and uh, it's uh, significantly higher. Uh, and when they uh, get uh, more information about the lab um, a treatment and what uh, are the specific features of the trial uh, uh, fish uh, that uh, we produce, uh, their, their willingness to pay even gets higher. And if we look uh, specifically on the gender scenario, we will see that for women, it's always either as much or higher than the average uh, willingness to pay. So this is 34 for average Rohu um, price premium after information and this is for female only so this is this shows that females are obviously more likely to pay more uh, so to summarize this finding uh, we understand that good aquaculture practice uh, uh, cultured fish uh, were more appealing to both male and female consumers but um, the female consumers were more willing willing to pay uh, higher premiums, which was like 29%, 16%, and 27% for Telapia, Pangasia, and Rohu, respectively, although they didn't know about the specific invisible attributes and production practices. And when they knew about these invisible attributes and production practices, uh, the premium reached even higher, 54%, 43%, and 51% for safer Talapia, Pangasias, and Rohu, respectively. So female consumers demonstrated a greater willingness to pay. Regression model after the consumers were informed about treatment, gender, uh, was a significant determinant of the price premiums for the safer fish group over the control group for tilapia and rupu. Uh, for pangasius, the result was not significant. Uh, so for summary and recommendations, this is the last slide. I hope I didn't go over too much of my time. Female fish producers have a double burden of unpaid household and aquacultural work low, with low decision-making power and lesser basic knowledge about safe fish production. They use safe practices but are less likely to spend money on themselves and may disregard their own own safety. Female consumers are significantly more likely to have safer practice scores than males. Uh, and female consumers expressed willingness to pay more for safe fish if they had more money to spend and if the fish was liked by their children. So here comes uh, probably, uh, although 
I haven't touched much on the third objective of the project. Uh, however, this is what has been identified that Bangladesh Food Safety Authority and uh, other concerned organizations should be more active and effective in providing food safety related training, devise effective ways to disseminate information about good aquacultural practices and labeling of safer products and practices and thereby strengthening their monitoring activities activities so that female producers consumers or consumers of all both genders can actually uh, be more inclined uh, to buy and eat safer fish products thank you very much i'm looking forward to your uh, feedback questions and concerns Thank you so much. That was a really engaging presentation. And I invite all of our um, panelists to turn on their videos as we move into the Q&A session of, um, of, our, of our presentation. So welcome, Leah, Samina, and Felipe. We really appreciate you joining us today and that we had a, a flawless technology experience with recorded videos. We got to always appreciate that. So um, really encourage those in the audience, if you have further questions, to please add them to the Q&A. Um, and we will um, ensure that our um, panelists actually receive those questions. If I could start off with, Leah, we have a, a, a question from the chat that's really quite curious. And I'm really looking forward to your answer. And that's in standpoint theory, what is the relationship between time allocation and identity? And it is, is it considered a one-to-one -one mapping? And perhaps give some context to that. Hi, everyone. Um, it's great to see you all today. Um, thank you so much for that question. Uh, and so uh, my understanding is wanting to know what this relationship is between standpoint theory, time allocation, and how does that relate to their identity? And is there a quantification associated with that? Um, so ba based off of my interpretation of the question, and please feel free to correct me if I am wrong, um, my the short answer is not necessarily. Um, there, there's not a one-to-one -one, uh, ratio application between the two. Um, and an example of this that comes that immediately comes to mind is if we're looking at our, our time use and all of these things that make up our standpoints and our identities, um, I immediately think about someone's job. Um, and we spend a lot of time at our jobs. And I would say that there are many people that I know whose uh, they would be very adamant in saying that their jobs do not define them and are not a part of um, what constitutes who they are or, or their identity. Um, even though, of course, it contributes a little bit, your profession contributes a little bit to what it is, but that still makes up a lot of your time. So it's not exactly the, this one-to-one um, -one ratio. At the same time, if we're thinking about these identity attributes like um, race or, or gender or your socioeconomic status, those are things that are always existent. And so again, it, it can be difficult to quantify those things when it comes to time use, because you are always your race, you are always your gender or, or whatever that might be. Um, so, so the way that I think of standpoint feminism is it's more of a mindset that you adopt. It's something that makes you think about Okay, how how does does this person's uh where where they live, how does that affect how they're contributing to the conversation and the information that I learned from this? It's not so much a quantifiable a quantifiable thing. I hope that answers your question. Um, and if it does, it I can answer more. Thanks so much, Leah. Yeah, no, it, it underscores that those relationships are certainly complicated and nuanced. Um, well, okay, there are a number of questions for you regarding um, your research and the application of our voice. And so the first one um, is how will the participating mothers and other stakeholders prioritize food safety improvement interventions that were identified using our voice app? Uh, thank you very much. Uh 
um, used to achieve food safety in their households. Um, and there are several critical stakeholders that have different roles to play. Um, what is essential is that these priority interventions can be grouped and faced to ensure a manageable and, uh, and uh, an approach that is systematic, that builds a strong foundation and gradually implements essential measures that enforces regulations and sustains progress over time. And so what is key here is coordination of efforts so that we can place emphasis on stakeholder collaborations and leverage existing platforms that are formal that we can use to coordinate these stakeholders. But also from a community perspective, um, we can work with the existing community structures, traditional structures and local government authorities to enforce community level re re regulations that are related to waste management and pest control and hygiene practices, not just in the households, but also in the markets and with the vendors. So in our next steps, we are planning community involvement in monitoring these practices in the different neighborhoods. And if we can co-create it with the community, it becomes owned and it becomes more effective and sustainable. So I don't know if I've answered the question, but these are some of the next steps that we're thinking of in achieving the mother's priority interventions, which they identified by themselves. Thank you, Fawke. I'd like Thank to you. with a, a subsequent question. And really, there's there's two questions that really um, taught, that came in from the audience that tie to the technology uh, aspect of, of how you collected this data. And uh, the first is what was the barrier for using um, normal or popular applications such as WhatsApp? So why did you use one voice and not WhatsApp? And what are some of the barriers of using our voice as well? Okay, thank you very much. Very good question. Um, we didn't use WhatsApp because the, our voice is specially tailored for research. And what do I mean by this? The our voice tool, the app, is able to collect photographs and link them to specific narratives that explain the photographs. And the narratives may be written, maybe um, audio, and these are uploaded. And when they are uploaded, they reach the back end. In that back end, it makes it easier for the researchers to collect all of this, transcribe, translate, analyze, and you know, bring out inferences. So for the WhatsApp, that would have been difficult to do because that means downloading different um, pictures and not being able to actually link them to the narrative or the audio that it belongs to. So that was the advantage. But with respect to the barriers, the most important barrier that I that we identified as a team was the issue of network. The um, internet connectivity was a big barrier. Uh, so sometimes the mothers would have collected the data during the day. And of course there was the function of offline collection. But when it was time to, another issue was the affordability of data, but of course the project um, took care of that, bore the cost of the data, the airtime for the mothers. And finally was the aspect of education. We found out that the older mothers, as well as those who had lower levels of education had a bit of a hard time understanding how to navigate the app and how to take the pictures without cutting off you know, important aspects of the picture. But at the training, we were able to address that. And also there was real time backstopping for the mothers during the data collection. From 8 a.m. to 7 p.m., there was a dedicated hotline for the mothers to call, and they could call different research assistants who were mapped to the different study areas. And within 30 minutes, the research assistants would appear at the mother's doorstep to help her out. That's Thank absolutely you. tremendous. Um, it, it demonstrates the power of technology, but also the challenges if you don't have the internet or a way to access, you know, continue that communication, which is not unique to Nigeria. It, it's a challenge even sometimes right here in Indiana. Um, 
Samina, a question for you is where can I get more information about the research in Bangladesh regarding women's willingness to pay for more safer foods? Right, thank you for the question. And uh, I just uh, uh, submitted an answer, which is about uh, one of the papers that was published uh, on the willingness to pay data. However, uh, the data looks at uh, both uh, males and females. Uh, the gender analysis uh, is yet to be published. So um, in order to get some idea about the willingness to pay, uh, you can look at the, um, at the paper I just mentioned in the, in the answer, answer box. Tremendous, thank you. Yeah, I know there's so much yet to come um, from all of the Food Safety Innovation Lab as research is, you know, on the, in our initial projects have just been completed. But as we all know, it takes a, a bit of time, sometimes more time than we like to, <laughs> than we'd like it to for our research results to be published and really come to light. Um, Leah, a question to you. Um, the intergenerational factor in Cambodian women vegetable pro producers' access to trainings was a really interesting discovery. How did that impact the design of your intervention outreach? And does it impact the content shared at the workshop as well as the marketing? I had to unmute myself. Um, so the question is, does intergenerational housing impact intervention design and how the content is delivered? Um, short answer is yes, it does. Um, but also that is still to be determined because at, at this point, of course, for our food safety projects in Cambodia, in Cambodia, we have not yet implemented a behavior design uh, or behavior intervention design. And so um, it will impact the, the design in the sense that as I said in the um, towards the end of my article or of my presentation, that uh, different factors like intergenerational housing and and others, uh, like if if you're married or where you live, if you're more rural, those will all impact someone's access to to things like trainings. So there are things that we are already anticipating designing for those interventions. One such thing is providing multiple opportunities at the same location with the same content for those uh, participants to join. Uh, another option is having them in a communal area that's easy to access uh, for, for people from multiple locations. And in intergenerational housing, uh, sometimes one positive component of being in intergenerational housing is that there are more people in your family. If you're, if you're a mother with young children, there's potentially more people in your family to uh, provide childcare while you could attend something like uh, a workshop, for example, on food safety. In these scenarios, we, um, in our focus group discussions, which is another study, we actually used this information to design those focus group discussions. And so we made sure that we provided child care and we encouraged women, hey, please feel free to bring your children if you can't make it, uh, if you don't have a child care option. So uh, yes, it does. And there are a couple of ways, like I, like I mentioned in a couple of examples to help mitigate some of those potential barriers. Yeah, thanks Leah. Yeah. I know. I have a, a question for um, Samina. Uh, based on the findings of this research and other research you've conducted, what forms messaging on food safety to women do you envision for Bangladesh? And how may this differ from outreach to the general public? Thank you, Hilary, for the question. Uh, uh, this is uh, something that um, we have been uh, thinking of uh, planning to sort of uh, execute uh, now that we know uh, that women are more likely to pay uh, higher prices uh, for safer fish. Uh, now what uh, needs to be done, I think, um, 
as uh, as far as I I can look at the training needs and I can see that there are gaps in knowledge uh, that needs to be addressed. So something that always comes up is the trainings and how they can um, uh, have more of a um, good aquacultural practices. So uh, it has to reach to the village level uh, for the women producers and um, traders. So I think it's it's a good idea that I kind of um, have been thinking uh, from the uh, gender uh, working group meetings that this mobile app can be one good uh, way to sort of try to get uh, to the women in the village level. Uh, however, what um, in Bangladesh, what happens is we rarely see uh, successful women role models in the sort of agricultural scenario. So whenever we see uh, TV ads and commercials or even documentaries, uh, if it's about farmers, uh, it's always men that we see. Uh, so if we can project uh, the, uh, you know, the role models um, in a more um, appealing manner so that women can see that even women can do good practices and can uh, produce safer uh, food and uh, specifically our if for our uh, one of our producers who, who actually did the trial uh, uh, fish uh, farming she was very successful and uh, we can uh, we are actually planning to project her um, uh, her story the journey and the struggles as well uh, so that women are more ready to uh, to face what what is uh, going to come if they want to start uh, being part of the producers because if you if you have seen that in in the first survey which is specifically on the producers uh, where we we saw like 110 uh, women who were involved in different parts of the value chain uh, but when the bigger um, survey we looked at the bigger survey we see that uh, there are only seven women as producers. So it's really difficult to find um, uh, like, you know, successful and even like good, good number of participation from women as agriculture uh, workers, because there is a gender norm, which tells, um, uh, which is very, uh, very, um, you know, which is very common in Bangladesh that says that women, they also do not want themselves to be regarded as the farmers or the, uh, you know, the fishermen. They call themselves that they are the assistants of their husbands or whoever is the owner of the uh, aquaculture business. So this is also an, another hurdle that we have to um, overcome. And in doing that, uh, training and more information has to reach these women in forms of leaflets, television commercials, billboards, even uh, uh, small uh, Utan boy talks like like meetings in their in their years. So yeard meetings uh, with successful women. Because when we look at we we look closely, we see that women, although they are not they didn't receive training, like 85% said that they didn't receive any formal training. However, they always they reported that they ask experienced farmers of the uh, of the village they ask their uh, other other members of the of the household who knows better uh, or the fish doctors who actually roam around so this is i think another thing that needs to be uh, fleshed out that women might not see these extension workers as providing training quote unquote training uh, but the extension workers are there and they're actually conversing with with these extension workers so if these extension workers not uh, took the uh, took the leaflets and other um, good aquaculture practice lessons for these women i think we already have the infrastructure we just need to sort of you know uh, make the information flow from the safety labs to the to the women who would be part of the value chains I hope that answers. I think question. so. Yes, thank you. Um, the next question is for uh, Falake, and that was how many households were involved and what was the ratio of households in high wealth index and low wealth index in the study? Thank you very much. There were 50 households and um, it was like a ratio of three to one for the low wealth index to high Wealth index. Thank you. 
You might have cut out when you answered how many households were in the study. If you could kindly repeat that, that would be great. Okay. Yeah, Falaka, you may want to turn but your... for this off. particular, our voice, it was 55 women. 55 women. There it goes. Your internet was just slightly Thank delayed, you. but we heard you. That's wonderful. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, Leah, um, back over to you. Um, did you find any other significant differences when you disaggregated your gender data by age? Yeah. Um, thanks for that question. When we disaggregated our gender data by age, uh, the most prominent trend that we noticed was that as age increased, the level of completed education decreased. Um, and so we had more older women who, who were illiterate or um, had only attended some primary school. And so our participants who had completed higher, uh, like upper secondary education, like high school, most of those were all our younger participants. And and I, I don't really know if there's an easy way to communicate this in the results, but we also noticed that the older women tended to be more talkative, which just meant that they gave us more data to work with um, looking at the transcripts. And I think this is understandable and makes sense because when when you're older, you have so many more experiences, <clears throat> excuse me, to draw from. And so you have more you can add to a conversation. And also, um, I think our age range was our oldest participant was 73 and our youngest was, I, I think, 20. And of course, someone who's older is going to be, be more confident in who they are and know who they are more than uh, a 20 year old, at least I can, I can attest to that. Uh, um, and so they just, they're, they're more confident and are able to pro typically able to provide us with just, just more information to go from. Well, Leah, I don't think you're alone in that. Yeah. I was just reflecting on that very idea the other day of I've been at Purdue for 14 years, but it's been 20 years this year since the uh, beginning of graduate school for me, which is amazing. <laughs> Where did time go? But just reflecting on, on how much, you know, personal development or, or just change that you experience in, in those. Uh, yeah. And then of, uh, another, another uh, theme that we, that we found was, especially in those intergenerational homes, uh, the older generation oftentimes set the tone for the rest of the household. And so in our interviews, when we were speaking with, if maybe our participant was from the middle generation and they lived with, they, their kids lived with them, their young kids lived with them, and then their parents lived with them, for example. Um, we had one situation where uh, the woman that we spoke to, her, her mother and father were sitting right there as well as, as we did our interviews because we did our interviews in homes. And uh, it was very clear that as she answered our questions, a lot of times she 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 looked and referred to her mother a lot when she when she would answer our questions, and so that played quite a role in setting the tone for the whole family that that older generation. I mean, I'm watching you nod along, and was curious if you had you know other things you'd add to that if, as you've done such a, a huge portfolio of work in this space. Thank you, Emily. Uh, I was nodding because uh, of two reasons, actually, because uh, similar experiences uh, I found when I, I was doing the focus group discussions, um, which were female only and uh, mostly from um, lower income group families. Uh, however, women with a sort of um, like older women tended to talk more than uh, and also it was interesting to see sort of how uh, how their identity was unfolding when uh, the younger ones had a different opinion about food safety for example uh, 
uh, because it, I was all the focus group discussions were about consumers. So uh, when it happened, like once, someone said that um, it's a good fish if it if it is attracting flies, and then someone else said like no no it's a good fish if it's not attracting flies. Now the problem was there was like almost a, like a you know uh, they were debating this idea. And then one, uh, the older person said, but you are wrong because uh, if, because in Bangladeshi wet markets, it's often uh, um, alleged that uh, uh, there are formalins, which are put in the fish to keep it fresh. So the older woman, woman was suggesting that if there are uh, no flies around it, it means actually there is too, too, many, too much formalin in it. So you should actually look for flies to get at least formalin free fish. So this was so interesting to see how these different ideas of um, what is safe food uh, can actually play in different, uh, in women's, you know, uh, how they actually process information, how much information are they exposed to. And I completely agree with Leah with, with, the, uh, with the idea that the, the whole concept of food safety might actually differ. Um, in different, uh, uh, even with like from women to women, depending on their level of education, their income, uh, as well as their age. Yeah, tremendous, and just just demonstrates that you know it's it's not unique to a country uh, that women have a lot of shared experiences, um, and and it's wonderful. I think that we've taken the time to celebrate them here today. I would like to end on one final question to Falake, and that was, we have a saying that a picture is worth a thousand words. When you look through the photos shared by your participants, what is the main message that you hear and what did it surprise you? Thank you, Haley. I'm looking at those plots is that household food safety is much more than the knowledge and skills of mothers. Um, the factors that affect food safety are infrastructural, the economic, the policy related, the cultural and so on. So these can either enable or hinder a woman's ability to maintain food safety for her family. So the photos highlighted the broader factors affecting food safety and acknowledge the complex challenges that women face in their roles every day as primary caregivers. For me, this understanding really underscores the need placing the responsibility of food safety in the household on the women. That, that is the main message that I can hear from the pictures. It doesn't surprise me so much but the um what we what i think is the extent of that complexity was not immediately apparent to me so pictures remain worth a thousand words leah samina falafi thank you um, for your time and for sharing your your studies and your expertise and experience uh, with us today and certainly we acknowledge and thank usaid for their support of the food safety innovation lab um, the link to this webinar and presentations will be shared by email, and we in, um, invite you to continue to follow along with the Food Safety Innovation Lab and um, the future of research in food safety. Thanks, and have a great rest of the day.